Okay, so um, this is just a quick re recap of what we did the last time. We looked at the partial molar Gibbs energy, and we said that um, partial molar Gibbs energy is equivalent to the chemical potential of a substance. We said that chemical potential is the potential for a solute or a substance in a chemical solution to be able to bring about change. It's the amount of push in a solution that a, that a, that a substance has, okay? So we said that when we had this equation from before, this G being equal to When we have that equation from chapter five, we say if we set P final to be equal to the pressure of interest that we're looking for, and P initial to be the standard pressure, then we would end up with this equation where G is just the Gibbs, molar Gibbs energy at whatever the pressure of interest is. G at the standard state, Gibbs energy, molar, plus RT, natural log of the pressure of interest over the standard pressure. Knowing that the standard pressure is one bar, that leads us to know that we can have an expression that says that G is equal to the molar Gibbs energy in the standard state plus RT natural log of P. <laughs> Knowing that the equivalence of delta G, the molar Gibbs energy, and the chemical potential means that The chemical potential of the reaction, it could, we could say that is the chemical potential of the substance J in question at the standard state plus RT natural log of the pressure of the substance of interest. So that's what these equations are telling us down here. So notice that this and this are in the same place in the place in the equation. That means that they're interchangeable. M sub J, the chemical potential of substance J in solution. So when you when you are asked to find the molar Gibbs energy of any substance, that is the same thing as the chemical potential of that substance. If you're asked to find the chemical potential, that is the same thing as the molar Gibbs energy. And you can look up the chemical potential of something by looking in the back of the book in Appendix D in the table where delta G sub M, molar Gibbs energy in the standard state, is located. Let me, let me, let me rewrite it down here. This is from the last lecture, but I'll rewrite it with a better explanation, I think, than I gave last time. Let me just rewrite it down here. So we know that this, this equation that I wrote right here was from last from the last chapter, right? From your, this one right here. We said that the Gibbs energy at the final pressure, when we have uh, a mixture of substances in the gaseous state is equal to the Gibbs energy at the initial pressure plus RT times the natural log of the initial pressure, I'm sorry, final pressure over the initial pressure. So if we assign that the final pressure, if we just call that final pressure, P sub F, the pressure of interest. We just take out, we just say, okay, whatever, the, the, the pressure of interest is, that's, we're just going to call that I, what, what we're trying to find. So we just, we just get rid of P, PF completely. So G is then going to be equal to, 
and we call PI, we let that equal to the pressure in the standard state. PI is equal to standard state pressure. And what is standard state pressure? One bar, right? Mm -hmm. So now we've got G and we've got G in the standard state. So when we have G in the standard state, we use that little circle thingy, right? So it's molar gives energy in the standard state plus RT natural log. And we said PF is just the pressure of interest. We're just going to take the F off. Natural log of P. When we put it over what PI is, which is this right here, it's effectively putting it over one, right? Because it's one bar. So since it's one bar, we can pretty much just get rid of it. So it would just be P. So therefore, that's our equation for molar Gibbs energy. But knowing that these are interchangeable, it's the same thing here. A J. Any, in, any substance J. The J is kind of like an X. It just means whatever substance you're talking about. So if I'm, the J could be, um, if I have a, a, a solution and it has um, benzene and toluene in it, and we're talking about, um, the J will stand for both of those solutions in turn. So it's going to say the J, M sub J is going to say in, in benzene and it will be toluene. Okay. Hmm? Mm -hmm. You'll be giving it. Or you can look it up in the back of the book because since you know that these are interchangeable, if you look up delta G, with a little circle on it, you can just use that value. And that's important to remember the equivalence because sometimes you'll be given um, information for delta V and asked to calculate the chemical potential. So it's always important to remember that those two are equivalent. So M is the chemical potential. Standard state pressure, one bar. Okay, so this is kind of a, supposed to be a review, so I'm going to go a little faster now. So I just wanted to kind of give a better explanation of that than I think I gave last time. Okay, so we did a problem that um, used this information. Um, we, if we are using the initial and final, we can, like we did in the, in the last chapter, we can leave our equation as we had it before, where we have um, P final over P initial, if we're not talking about um, the standard state, I'm sorry, the standard pressure, if we have different pressures than standard, okay? So in this case, we, we're told that the pressures are 150. So therefore we use the values for the final pressure and the initial pressure in the problem. Then I made up a problem here. You can go back when I post the video from last time, you can go back and look at how we worked that out. Okay. You can post, oh, you can post. I mean, it's, it'll be posted. I, I have them in my office around the corner. Okay. 
um, we then start talking about the ideal and the ideal dilute solutions. We talked about um, the ideal solution being a solution that is um, um, a liquid solution that has components that are similar in composition, like benzene and toluene, similar in molecular composition, like the like dissolves like. And Raoult's law actually allows us to be able to describe the chemical potential. And for the most part, when we talk about Raoult's law, we're really talking about the chemical potential of the solvent. I'm sorry, the partial pressure. We're talking about the, the properties of the solvent. And I don't think I, I, I specified that last in the last lecture. But make sure, remember J is any substance. A specifies the solvent and B specifies the solute. So Raoult's law is a law that tells us that the partial pressure is proportional to the mole fraction of the solvent. So partial pressure of A is proportional to the mole fraction of A times the pressure of the um, the um, the pure the pure liquid, and that's what this is: pressure of the pure liquid substance. We saw that we have another equation: delta. And we can calculate the chemical potential then using this equation of the solvent by saying that RT, natural log of the mole fraction times X, gives us the chemical potential. So that's another equation we saw. And then we went on to work um, a problem using Raoult's law. And once again, this should really be A here. It's just a matter of, you know, notation, that's all. And we worked um, the problem where we used, the, that where we calculated the chemical potential. Okay. Then we went on to look at um, how we calculate, well, a different type of solution, ideal dilute solutions. Ideal dilute solutions are not the same as ideal solutions in that we used Henry's law to describe ideal dilute solutions. And when we describe these solutions, we're really talking about them in terms of properties of the solvent, I'm sorry, solute, the thing that is dissolved. So Henry's law is what we use to describe the properties of the solute. We have the concentration here. It's proportional to the Henry's law constant times the pressure of the solute. Okay, so this is the form of Henry's law that we will use most often. Here is an alternative form of Henry's law where you have the pressure of the solute being proportional to this form of Henry's law constant times the mole fraction of the solute. So this is the one we'll be using for your assignments and your tests. PB, uh huh. Pressure of the of the solute. Hmm. Yeah, um, that is the PB is a pressure of B. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the pressure of B. I'm sorry, concentration B. Yeah. KH, K Henry. So um, I think we, yeah, we worked a problem. We were, we were starting to work that problem where we're dealing with Henry's law. Yeah, we did. Um, what partial pressures needed to dissolve 21 grams of carbon dioxide and 100 grams of water? We worked that problem in the last, um, at the very end of the last class. And um, we got down to the point where um, we found the, the concentration, I think. So we had our 
what partial pressure is needed to dissolve 21 grams of carbon dioxide. So if this is our expression, and we're now trying to calculate the pressure of carbon dioxide, which is PB, and B is CO2. We rearrange the equation so that the concentration of CO2 is now over the Henry's Law uh, constant for CO2. And I showed you in the previous slide that there's the table that shows you the Henry's Law expressions. And you see what the unit is for, Ken, for K. Henry. You have um, kilopascal per cubic meter per mole. Okay, so you plug in the concentration, which we found by um, calculating from 21 grams of carbon dioxide being dissolved in um, the volume of water. We've got the volume of water by taking the density of water, which is 100 grams. We found the volume by the density, so grams into milliliters is a factor of one. So 21 grams is 44 milliliters. And it's 0.47 moles. And then we have 100 grams of water, which is 100 milliliters. So when we convert that to liters, because we're trying to find molarity, we have 0.1 liters. So we divide those two things together, and this is our concentration for the carbon dioxide. And I think I think the video kind of stopped because I think that I had didn't have my power cord and I think we kind of got shut off when I started plugging this in. So um, let's make sure our units are right. So I'm going to plug it in again and make sure our units are good here. So let's plug in the concentration and the. Um, the correct units for Henry's law constant. So we've got four. 0.7 moles over liters, which is per decimeter cubed, right? Moles per decimeter cubed over, what did I say the, 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 the units for Henry's Law constant were? Oh, what did I say the value for Henry's Law constant was? I just erased it. 2.93, okay. Kilopascal. Over a meter cubed per mole, okay. Okay. So basically, we need to get these two things to cancel, right? So we need to convert meters cubed into, let's say we're going to convert meters cubed into decimeters cubed. And let's just do that by there's a thousand, milli, uh, thousand cubic decimeters and a cubic meter. Okay, so basically, when you do that, your meters cubes here cancel, your cubic decimeters here cancel, your moles here cancel, and now you are left with your kilopascals. Whatever your answer is should be in kilopascal.
Okay, so now let's move on to what we're supposed to be talking about today right quick. Okay. You got it now? Okay. All right. So today we're going to finish up and talk about real solutions, first of all. The only thing I want you to know about real solutions is that we have something called a fudge factor in physical chemistry. This fudge factor allows us to use something that we call an activity. And this is really important because you're gonna see this in your equilibrium packet. We can use what we call an activity to make sure that we, that, that the concentration or the pressure or whatever, um, whatever unit that we report that represents amount of, so of, of solute is universal. So basically, you know, we can talk about partial pressure and concentration as being the way that we can represent how much of something is present. So, Talk about the pressure of B or the concentration of B. Now look at this table. If you now take and divide this by a fudge factor, standard pressure and standard concentration, you end up taking it and dividing this effectively by one bar. If you have a pressure of one bar at the bottom, whatever your 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 amount your 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 pressure is at the top, you're going to divide it by one bar. Let's say you have 20 bar up here, and at the for a concentration, whatever your pressure is, I'm sorry, whatever your concentration is, you're going to effectively end up dividing it by mole per liter or mole per cubic decimeter. So basically, you're going to end up dividing it by molar. So let's say you got a concentration that is 1.0 molar, and you're going to end up dividing it by one molar. So these activities are a way to make sure that our values are unitless. They're just what we call a fudge factor. So that's a fudge factor, a lie factor. It allows us to be able to manipulate the data in a way that the value doesn't have to have a unit. So the activity for pressure, when you see it written like this, this is saying pressure over pressure not, and pressure not is one bar. So that means when you divide the pressure by the pressure of one bar, all it's doing is getting rid of the unit of bar. Okay. When you see the concentration, it's gonna be concentration divided by the unit of mole per liter. So effectively, all it's doing is getting rid of the concentration unit. So you will see activity written like this as an A. So rather than seeing molar concentration of B, you will see activity of B. So you're gonna see that in your next chapter for sure. Okay, now, colligative properties. This is what your lab is going to be about. You know colligative properties from general chemistry. Colligative properties are things that depend on amount of solute present. It doesn't have anything to do with the identity of the solute. So basically, we can say if something is a non-electrolyte, which means if it is something like sugar or something that does not ionize in solution, then no matter how much of it you have present, I'm sorry, no matter what, what kind of substance it is, if it's a non-electrolyte, if you have five moles of sugar and five moles of some other substance, those two things should have the same effect on a solution. If I put sugar on the ice cube and that other substance on the ice cube, it should raise or lower the freezing point 
the same way. Okay, so so here are our colligative properties osmotic rate I'm trying to speed up here so I'm losing my mind we're going to get through this I'm going to speed through it okay The first one is the elevation of the boiling point. You can change the temperature at which a liquid boils or a substance boils if we multiply its boiling constant or what's called its ebullioscopic constant, ebullioscopic, That's this boiling point, point constant times the molality. And this B right here means molality. It is, but don't count on it. You're going to have to keep your eyes open. Simeon's mama. Simeon is sleeping in class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Simeon. So all you got to do in order to determine what, um, what, how much temperature reduction you get or an increase you get. So, you know, we put salt in our eggs when we want the temperature to increase, you know, right? We put salt in our water when we want it to boil hotter. So to figure out how much hotter it boils, and all you got to do is put the molality of that water solution times the ebullioscopic constant for water. Okay. The same exact equation applies for freezing point depression. If we want to put that same salt on an ice patch outside to lower its freezing point so it doesn't freeze up so fast, we then say we can depress the freezing point by taking the cryoscopic constant and multiplying it by the molality of the solution. And remember, molality is moles over kilograms of solvent. This is the cryoscopic constant. Okay. Cryoscopic. Freezing point constant. C R Y. You remember, like, uh, you see the ebullioscopic. E B U L L I O. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. E B U L L I O. S C O P S C. So there are several different things that you can determine from these types of equations. You can know um, what the solution molality is after you observe a temperature increase or decrease from the presence of that solute in solution, or you can determine how much temperature increase or decrease you get from the presence of that solute being in solution. So make sure you read your lab before Thursday because we're going to do a freezing point depression. And it's, it's kind of a gymnastics. It's kind of a neat little freezing point. Did you, you guys do a freezing point depression experiment in general, right? I 
So we're gonna do a neat little variation on that. We're gonna do um, we're gonna do, we're gonna graph it and um, and titrate to find the concentration. So your 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 the variation we're gonna do on that is gonna be really really neat. I like it. So um, let's look at a problem using this. Estimate the lowering of the freezing point of a solution made by dissolving about one cube of sucrose, which is three grams and 100 grams of water. So what we need to do for this is find the ebullioscopic constant of water. And I hope I have my table. Man. Who's got their book? So what we would do is the amount of freezing point lowering we get is delta TF times the freezing constant times the molality. So what is the molality? It's three grams. 18 grams per mole and 0 0.1 kilograms, right? So give me the molality of that solution. Mm -mm. Divide three by 18. Is that the whole thing? Seven? Molal. That's little m. 1.67 molal. Molal. That's not a new term. That's a general chemistry term. Molal. Mm-hmm. Mm -mm. That's the real name. The other one is molar. And this one is molal. That's the... That's the type of calculation. It's a molality. That's the definition of what the type of calculation is. But when you pronounce it in a concentration term, so like if I'm talking about something in such and such moles per liter, I'm oh, saying it's like molar. molar. Oh, yeah, molar. Right. But if it's like with a little m, it's molo, molal. Mm -hmm. So when you look up your KF in your book, in your little table where you see the value for the cryoscopic constant of water, you will have a value here, and it will plug it in right here. That's your assignment, and it's going to give you your delta T. And a rare, uh, that's as simple as that, right? So I, I know y'all have seen these types of problems before. So there's only one more type of thing. What is osmosis? That is also a type of colligative property. No, osmosis. Yeah. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Osmosis is the traveling of a. Right. So we go from a, see, I know it. I know it. I knew y'all remembered that. So we go, we take a solvent from a, through a semi-permeable membrane, not the solute, but we take just the solvent across to a semi-permeable membrane. So the amount of pressure that will be required to stop that solvent from being transported across that semi-permeable membrane is called the osmotic pressure. So if this is the semi-permeable membrane right here, and if this solvent is trying to go over here, there's an external pressure from the air, whatever, on both sides of the solution. <laughs> it's just allowed to pass freely, no big deal. Whatever is the external pressure. There's an additional amount of pressure, which is the osmotic pressure, and that solution of solvent gets to have to stop 
coming across that semipermeable membrane. The amount of extra pressure that has to be applied to make it stop is called the osmotic pressure. The amount of pressure to stop the travel of solvent across a semi-permeable membrane. Now that's some pretty writing right there. I don't know what y'all talking about. <laughs> to stop the amount to stop. <laughs> I don't know, Kelly. We about what and what. <laughs> The travel, yeah, I think so. <laughs> to stop the travel of a solvent across a semi-permeable membrane. Travel of solvent across a semi-permeable membrane. I try sometime. I'm trying now. Jamie, we need some human hair. A natural. Some bad stuff. Come on, come on. We need to, we need to her to play with. We actually hers is gonna be a keratin treat, a formaldehyde free keratin treat. The uh undergraduate research students are working on um looking at the effects of of the different types of relaxers and they may actually start looking at a protein based glutathione type relaxer system and then how to rebuild those bonds back up with a natural. But um I don't think I think I think we're gonna do the keratin treatment with Alicia and then work on the with well, the actual chemistry student work on the um the the natural relaxer or try to. Okay. Anyway, I got off the subject. I just completely, completely ignored my rest of my students. I'm sorry, cookies. I'm so sorry. Okay, so PV equals NRT. Bam. Okay, so the osmotic pressure, we're going to call it pi. So we're just going to substitute that pressure for this pressure. Pi V equal N. R T. Mm -hmm. Okay, the end we're talking about is that solvent A. Okay, so now if we take the osmotic pressure, and now we say solvent A over, uh oh, we say, uh, yeah, my bad, my bad, my bad, I was writing it right. Moles of A over volume times RT. What is moles of A over volume? Mm hmm. Moles over volume is what? What kind of concentration? Bam. There you go. So osmotic pressure is equal to the concentration 
of A over RT. So the amount of osmotic pressure is going to be equal to the moles of the, of the solvent times the R times the T. And I don't think I have an example for that one because I don't think um, that one's going to be a huge, that one's not going to play a huge role. I just wanted you to know that equation. I probably would give you one problem on your, one really simple problem on your take home. Okay. So, <coughs> recapping. I'm not going to do the open lab tomorrow. We're going to just do the lab on Thursday. We probably will have an open lab next Wednesday. You will have these videos uploaded as soon as I can. I do have meetings this evening. I'm going to try to upload these as soon as I can. Um, the video for Chapter 7, Chapter 7 will probably be video-based. Um, we're going to do, I'm going to get it uploaded as soon as I can. The accompanying handouts, PowerPoints, or whatever will be uploaded as well. And you will have your assignment for these two chapters as a take-home assignment, which is where you will get your grade from. Um, you will not have class on Thursday because I have a meeting with, with um, the faculty and the president. And then we have one more chapter. We have committed. Um, 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 yeah.